during the introductory session, I had the occasion to be on stage, so welcome again. I think that it will be difficult for me to live up to all the challenges that were just thrown at me by Yulia. If I could tell you what internet will be like in a few years, I would be the richest person in the world. Perhaps I would be able to predict uh, the future the same way that uh, people who invented Facebook uh, did. Uh, they started with um, doing things for fun, and eventually they came up with the largest social media portal in the world. I would like to do something else. I would like to share some reflection with you. What is uh, the place of a man in the digital world? And actually, I should rephrase the title of this presentation. I should say, where in this virtual world we may find some places of uh, affinity, be it school or uh, some kind of job that you have, because this is where you meet others on the internet, including children and youth. So the question is what the digital world is like. And I thought that the best way to describe this digital world is to share some data. I, I come from the generation that uh, has uh, technology fright. So whenever I have to use new technology, I'm always scared that it's not going to work. But fortunately, it works. 2020, 10 billion people on this globe. How many people will be there? No one knows. No one knows for sure. Because I remember that when I was young, it was said that uh, there will be 40 billion people. So. It's hard to tell whether we will reach 10 billion or not, but uh, there will be more of us than today. Uh, certainly, there will be more colors compared to this slide, but this is the starting point. But in 2020, there will be 50 billion devices connected to the internet. So statistically, there will be five devices per person. Uh, today, I do have some devices that are connected to the internet, like my smartphone or this laptop that I'm using. But practically speaking, everything can be connected to the internet. See, the iron, and this is no coincidence. You can add a fridge right here. Koreans have been connecting their fridges to the internet for a long time. And the car and tablets. Tablets will probably look differently in some years into the future. And the cars will probably um, feature different uh, uh, different things. But today, the network would uh, be able to accommodate 200 billion devices. So from the technology, technology point of view, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Doesn't matter how many devices you want to get connected. Uh, obviously, when you look at these numbers, it turns out that there are huge numbers of devices on, on per capita. But statistics will not give you the full pictures because some people have more devices, some people have no devices. So this is not such a straightforward uh, calculation. But let's look at the facts. The digital world uh, will continue to be around us. It's everywhere, everywhere you go. So as a result, the digital world will force us to do certain things, whether we like it or not. During the previous presentations, uh, you were able to see different approaches. You can take big data as a threat or as an opportunity. You can look at the virtual world as a place of hope or as a place that is turning into something that we would rather not to have. But now, let's speak about the information. It's all about data. The volume of digital data is going to triple by 2020. This is what the surveys and studies tell us. But what I really like, you know, I have the problem with such a large sequence of numbers. So 204 million emails are sent per minute, every minute, globally. So this is something that is hard to control. And speaking of control, I want you to look at the control from a different perspective. So we are being um, under surveillance of various companies, agencies, uh, governments, whoever, whatever. But mind you, until today, we have not come up with an effective method 
to make this control work, which is good and bad. Why is it good and why is it bad? It is good because as a result, our uh, privacy is somewhat protected. And for one reason or another, despite all the technological systems and all the political undertakings, uh, suddenly the ISIS has emerged and no system was able to grasp it. And this is now in the Antarctic continent. This is a, con this is a new state that is emerging next door and it's threatening the whole world. So although we have capacity to make surveillance and control the data, it doesn't mean that we are able to do it for the right cause. And that's kind of frightening, but each uh, office worker in 2015 will produce 3.6 gigabytes of data. This is frightening too, why? Because we generate data, we produce information, but it's not always needed. And I'm saying that being fully conscious of that, of what I'm saying, because the, the, the volume of data is humongous. So the volume of data that is um, around us could actually fill the, the pile of iPad Air um, tablets, and that would stretch up to 253,000 kilometers. So two thirds of the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Can you imagine the volume of the information that is around it? We live in the information world, in the data world. Myself, I'm not able to grasp it. And actually, the volume of the digital world doubles every two years. So more and more data is coming in. Data is something what we live in, something that we use, and something that is over flooding us. So if you look at the very simple data, that um, illustrate the digital world and the media world because they come together. Well, in the past, in the past that more mature people in this room are able to remember, in Poland we had two TV channels, two. Today there are 300 TV channels available to an average user. So that gives you the scale and this is also the scale of information and data that is uh, unfolding around it. But the data and the information is not useful when it's not sorted, when it's not selected. Okay, now let me speak about nice things. So the reality is digital, but my question is, is it? This is a palm tree, and the palm tree grows uh, right on the beach and you have a sunset, and many people say that this is kind of a kitschy photograph. Well, I love it, More, and moreover, I'd rather be there. So is the reality um, really digital? No, Re reality is real, and we face two worlds. I think that when you're sitting at this conference, you are able to see that because Professor Brzezanowski's presentation was really about it. We've got a digital world and we have the real world. Perhaps it's two in one, but it's not true that everything is digital. Probably you had breakfast today, at least during the last break, and hopefully you refreshed yourself. So were your buns digital? No, they were not digital. It was true bread. The digital bread is not existent. So you don't have digital sandwich, and uh, there are few digital things, and things that are digital will not become materialized. So food can be um, synthetic, it can be plastic, but it cannot be digital. No one can be fed with a broadband or a cable, but this is part of our reality. So the reality comes in the digital setting and also in the real setting. Another picture. We are not going to show computers, but pictures. There is another concept from the point of view of education and school. Um, everyone says that in this world, everyone has creativity and everyone uh, is able to create things. Is it true? And let me now draw on some data. It will be a follow-up on the previous presentation that showed the internet activity of young people. Well, yeah, adults are also very passive and entertainment 
oriented when we surf on the internet. We are not all in the position to build such piece of architecture as you can see here from the Cordoba, from the mosque. We are many times just consumers. So the world has not changed to such an extent that everyone has become a creative person. The fact that you post your pic uh, picture on the Snapchat or Instagram doesn't mean that you are creative. The fact that you communicate with someone over the internet it doesn't mean that you are creative. And when you are downloading movies, well, it could be ethically questioned and sometimes uh, straightforward illegal. So the creative uh, zone is uh, just for a number of people, not for all the people. So this is part of the reality, and this is, has not changed. The internet has opened up many opportunities to men, to all the people. Yes, it's true, but those who are proactive are in the minority. Let me just give you an anecdote, or well, um, sometimes we speak with friends, we talk to people saying, oh, I'm trying to be active, I'm trying to be creative. I remember back in the communist times, uh, there was a uh, questioner, and people were asked, do you like classical ballet? And 70% of respondents said, yes, I like ballet. Mm, or 60% were saying, I love drama, I love Shakespeare, I love challenging. Uh, mm, uh, challenging um, theater plays. So it sounded good, but actually these declarations, these claims in the questionnaire were not true. So the world that we live in connects both the digital and the offline, the digital uh, and the real, let's say. But are these two developed at the same pace? I mean, well, in the 19th century, there was uh, press, the press, then in the 20th, there was still the press, but the radio was there. But did the radio kill the press? No, they could coexist. And the cinema came to the world, right? And at first, people thought, that's crazy, motion pictures. This is crazy. Or like the first vehicle where someone had to walk in front of uh, the first models of cars to warn all the pedestrians that a car was coming. But well, all of them developed, the cinema, the cars, and everything. Just like right now, we have the internet. We have cinemas. We have television, even though people were saying television would be dead soon. We have digital radio, maybe the printed press is not so well, but the carrier has changed, the medium has changed, but the press is there, actually. It's not printed. So they exist, the real, the virtual, they coexist, they function, they develop at different paces, right? And what about school? Because the whole thing is sort of bringing me to the subject of school. Digital school or a good school? Maybe it's a stupid question. Maybe, I don't know. But the question is real. What should our school be like? It should be good, right? I guess I, I don't want to do a show of hands. I, if someone uh, does a show of hands from the stage, I never like it, so I'm not going to do this. But you want all, probably, school to be a good school, yeah? Sure. Should it be digital? All the technology, all the things I talked about, all the things that surround us should serve the school, right? So the fact that we introduce interactive uh, whiteboards so that we have better computers at school, that we have uh, smartphones, and, and they are used for not only for play, but also for school, right? It's good. Is it good? Schools should be good, right? That's what we expect. Uh, school has to play its role, has to fulfill its role. Just like mm, the question that I started with, do we even need school? Because right now, some people might say, everything can be found online. Do you even need school? Do we? We do. Certainly we do. School, and a good one at that. And at school, or in a school environment, there's two people or two roles. Some say that also it's parents, but parents don't come to school all that much. So you have the teacher and the student, right? And they, there is a relationship between them, regardless of the technology that's being used. So I want you to look at this from a different perspective. Do all those processes 
that I'm talking about, do they change the dynamics of a school environment, the teacher, the student? Hmm. Someone might say, it's complicated. Sure, it is. It's taken me several minutes to give you some knowledge. And also, we have things like knowledge, information, truth. They are very different uh, notions. If you go to Google and if you type in these things, that the records, the number of records, the number of answers you're going to get. So, did the digital world change school? Sure it did. Because today, a student, if they are allowed to use a digital device, oh, although in some schools they're not allowed, they can check something that's during the lesson and they say, look, I found it. So knowledge, information, it can reach students online or through the internet. So is the teacher redundant? Should the teacher know all these things and all these answers, not to be redundant? Of course, he or she will not know everything. They will not have all the knowledge that's out there, right, in all those websites um, that come up in your search. If you're a history teacher, you will never go through 3 million pages or around 3 million pages about the Warsaw Uprising, right? It's impossible, and you don't need to. Today's digital world should motivate us, even though we have a problem with that, motivate us to select information, to be, to use it deliberately, to use it with consciousness, to use all those resources well for learning. But does that mean that a student can be smarter than the teacher? People ask me sometimes, right? So if during, a, during class a student asks something of me, and I don't know the answer, is the student smarter? It doesn't mean they are smarter. It means they have a certain piece of information that the teacher doesn't have. So we sometimes mistake information that, are, that people possess with knowledge, with experience, and the roles, and the competence in the roles that they play. A teacher at school is not Wikipedia, nor should they be. So who is? A teacher, the teacher, a guide. The role of teachers is changing. A teacher, and that's why it, uh, I've capitalized the word no teacher, teacher, because it's an important role. A teacher should be like a guide, because if today's school will should be all about, you know, uh, students competing with teachers in. Uh, searching for information quicker, being more uh, savvy in terms of technology, it's going to be a failure. Probably the students might win. They might be better in these things. But it doesn't mean that they will be able to replace their teacher. The teacher is to explain, to give a context. Because if you have the 3 million pages mm, websites about the Warsaw upbringing, uh, the Warsaw Uprising, uh, out of the three million, a lot of it might not be true. I'm not even saying they might be opinions. These might be things that are not true, that are harmful. So not everything out there online is giving you real information. So the teacher has to be aware of the fact that their students will may know more or may know a lot, but uh, still, they have their role as a teacher. The process of digitalization is sort of goes in two ways. One way is more democracy, right, in the school environment. The student becomes more of a partner, more of an equal partner, because they can create things with more freedom. So the teacher will have to become more of a guide. The teacher will be someone who will explain this world, but explain it not by having a lot of information, because it's impossible for the teacher to have a lot of info, all the information out there. So explain the world. So it's a completely different world. So the question, another question, what's important, what's relevant today? I write, I read, I understand. 
Yeah, but that's very basic. Learning to write, learning to read, learning to understand. First grade, right? Well, it's first grade, but also it's the very foundation of what we should be, what we should have. Because we live in the, in the society and we have a dialogue with the society, a conversation. But unfortunately, so many of us have lost the ability to create, basically to create. I'm not talking about writing uh, manually, even though that's difficult. But you know, to create in a sense that we've lost the ability to express thoughts. So many of us, we don't read. And so many of us, even if we read or hear something, we don't understand it. We don't understand the messages that reach us. And this um, causes a number of uh, consequences. So we have to teach people to write, encourage them to read, and get them to understand what they're reading. Because so many people can technically read, but they don't understand what they are reading. So unfortunately, this may uh, lead to deception, to manipulation. People might deceive us. People might manipulate and mishandle our data. Advertising can manipulate people. It might mean that a message that reaches us, we see it as something objective, as a fact. But if we don't understand it properly, it might turn out to be advertising and in a way to manipulate us. So, well, today, if you go to any website, you just go, you have a read. And for example, you go to a blog where uh, there's a blogger who says, my blog costs 5,000 zlotys for, for each of my entries. That's how much money I'm getting. And then all the journalists are saying, wow, a successful blogger, cool. But so many people think it's true. So many people might think that this blogger is honest and loves what he or she is doing. But actually, the blogger earns so much money because he or she is advertising certain products, placing certain products. So you never know. Is it fact or is it product placement with this blogger? But people start envying them because they're so successful. So let's remember the basics, right? I write, I read, I understand. Another thing, the real world and the common sort of the shared experience. Uh, look at this, that's a building in Poland. We all remember it, we, we all know it exists. It looks pretty impressive. It's nice, might be. Arguably, it's one of the more beautiful places in Poland, and foreigners and tourists appreciate it a lot. So that's the um, Mariacki Church in Krakow. And that's something, the fact that we know, that all of us know it, it's our shared experience. It's our common experience. So these days, shared experience means a lot. Those of you who are more or less my age, you'll remember that at when you came to school in the morning, everyone was saying, did you see that movie last night? Did you see that game last night? But these days, there's so much access to so much media, to so much information. And it's on the one hand, it's good. But on the other hand, it's more difficult to build common experience. And schools should be building shared experience, sort of selecting some of the things that could be the foundation, that could be the basis. And if you have, as a basis, a common experience, then you can go on building wonderful social relationships, wonderful, important values. And through shared experience, all the students who are guided by the guide, by the teacher, they create a community. So shared experience is something that's very important. Uh, because we all want to experience the world, experience emotions. Why do people, for example, go to the theater? Why do they go and watch a football or a soccer game? Because it's a shared experience for them. It's emotions that they share together. Those who are very engaged and involved 
in the virtual world, uh, most of the time people who are active and creative online, they are the creative types offline as well. Mm, that so many people, for example, like uh, mass events. They like historic, uh, historical reenactments, for example, because they can get together and share something. Okay, that's one thing. Reality, the real world. You can't fake it. Look at these things. Uh, some mountain uh, landscape. The Sahar cake. Be wonderful cake. Very very high in calories, but it's really tasty. That's the a gorge in the Lubelskie uh, region, Matternhor, a mountain that is so unique, it cannot be faked. Each of these things is something that cannot be faked, it's very unique. So these things, they come from the real world and they give us the emotions, the experience. So. Whatever we see in the virtual world should be um, encouraging us to go out in the real world and explore as well and look for experiences. So, you know, technology can help democracy, but it also can help dictatorship. If it's through invigilation, it's going to help dictatorship. If it's access to information, it's democracy. And, well, we have to keep our balance. We have to make sure that we're getting more, a bigger picture, that we're getting more from it, that we're getting more opportunities. Well, future is in our hands. It depends on what we do. That's a picture of cacti. They are beautiful plants, but they're difficult to maintain. But if you take the trouble, it's going to be beautiful. But it's a challenge because think about lifting this little plant without gloves, for example, right? So school these days, contemporary school, and the extension of school, namely social development, the future of school, the future of social development is in our hands. We have to, we have a lot of information, right? flooding us. There is a deluge of information. And if we don't use a guide to guide us, to navigate, help us navigate, we're not going to develop properly. So let us take the cacti and take good care of them, and they're going to develop and grow 